followed, obviously, by the 139th Psalm. <laughs> but I mention that because they are two of my very favorite psalms. So listen, if you will, for the word of the Lord. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks for, to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased the strength of my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For th though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hand. And we continue, as Jack has mentioned before, to follow the prescribed lectionary readings for this particular year. And so, but we've been in the Gospel of, of uh, John. We last week and today, are in the Gospel of Mark now. And we're in the third chapter, beginning with the 20, 20th verse. Jesus has just called the 12 disciples. Then he, he went home. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying... He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him, and he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, then the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. And then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins, but whatever blasphemies they utter against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, for it, 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 but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they have said he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and brothers and sisters? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my sisters and brothers. Whoever does the will of, the, of God is my mother and my sister and my brother. And this is the word of the Lord. The crowds were everywhere. They even followed Jesus when he went back home and tried to get into a house where he could have just a little bit of rest. And the word about what he was doing and saying has spread all across the countryside. It's even reached back to his hometown and into the house where his mother and brothers and sisters live. And it's chaos. It is chaos. And Jesus, well, 
From the outside looking in, it looks exactly, exactly as if Jesus has gone completely off the rails. I think about it. He is accused of being in league with Satan. And he's breaking sacred laws and flouting sacred traditions. And these are things he grew up with that his mother and his parents taught him as he was maturing. Jesus is seriously in trouble with the law. Now, depending on your view, he's either mad or he's miraculous. He's causing such a stir that the, the heavy guns, the big folks have come down. The, the powerful religious leaders have come to confront him, and, and they're plotting against him, as we know. They're plotting to arrest him and even worse. So this is the question for you this morning. If you were Jesus' family, what would you do? Well, in this day and time, what you might do is call a family conference. And you might hold, have to gather together to try to decide what is the best way to bring this child, this man who's your child, under control before he harms himself or someone else. And if you're his mother, it may be that as this discussion is taking place, your very heart is breaking because you remember that precious little boy with those big dark eyes and dark curly hair. He was so smart. He was bound for greatness. And now he's gone completely off the rails. Perhaps, after all, the best idea really is to just bring him home and tend to him quietly. To just bring him, put, close the door, bring him inside where nobody can see him and hear him, and try uh, to take care of him. Then maybe, just maybe, if you do that, all this embarrassing, all of this embarrassing stuff that he is saying, all of this about this is my family and even the threats from the really important people, maybe if you can get Jesus out of sight, it will all disappear. And that's where we are in today's scripture. The other morning, over a cup of coffee, I was browsing through the morning newspaper Actually, I was headed to the comics, which I read almost as faithfully as I do my morning devotions. I came across an editorial by a journalist who writes for one of the larger papers in the country. Now, hear me carefully. Her main issue is not relevant to what I hope you hear this morning. Hers is a political column, and it advocates a political stance, and you will not hear that from this pulpit. Nonetheless, as I looked through the column, I came in the very center of the column, about a little piece, you know, just, just a couple of col column inches long. And as I read it, I have to confess, I read it a second time because it threw me for a loop. And this is what she wrote. It is now commonly held that citizens can and should practice their religious beliefs in private but remain neutral in public, she goes on. It is possible that that approach rests on the assumption that beliefs are not things that influence everyday life. There's more to her writing, but is that true? Is that really true? Is it commonly held that we believe in private and live neutrally in public? That's kind of what was happening in the scripture this morning. Come on, Jesus. Come on home. 
you're not well. We will take care of you. Bless your heart. You've lost your way. You're losing your mind. Let's get you back in secret where we can help you and there'll be no more embarrassing declarations about families and no more provoking the powers that be to the point of arresting you. Neutral in public, faithful in private. Now, truthfully, when I read this, my own heart hurt because <laughs> my actions often convict me of neutrality. And also in truth, this is just not the sermon I wanted to preach this morning because it hits too close to home. The question is, what are you willing to do to live out your faith? Anybody here an interior decorator? If you are, you're not confessing to it, huh? Well, there's a phrase that I've noticed interior decorators tend to use, and when they're looking at a room, they say, well, let's do it in neutrals, and we'll add pops of color. I wonder, is that a description of our lives today in the church? And in the world, every now and then we add a pop of faith. Maybe it's a pop of green over here to support sister care. And maybe it's a pop of a little bit of yellow over here to, to make it light and to add some hope. And then, of course, we want just a little bit of blue because we might share in our friends' pain and grief. I suggest that what we need is a great big splash of red. Yes, red. The kind of red that is blood beating through our very hearts, energizing our hands and our feet. The red of the blood of the new covenant of grace, love, forgiveness, and peace. Neutral, not if you follow Christ, not if you listen to the Holy Spirit, not if hunger, homelessness, and pain still roam the streets of this city and this country. Jesus was not neutral. He came to turn the world on its ear, and that's exactly what he did. Here's what he didn't do. He didn't divide. He didn't isolate. He didn't exclude. And he didn't condemn. He simply called all whose burdens are heavy to come to him. He called his disciples, he calls you and me, to reveal the very source from which all the colors of our faith, all our love, all our life originates. The source that is the light that shines in the darkness. The source that is the light darkness did not overcome. The source of love and grace and forgiveness. Neutral in public, faithful in private. Jesus said, all who follow me are my brothers and sisters, and in my name they share a cup of cold water. They give a portion of bread. They share a warm coat. Neutral. Never. Amen.
Let us stand now and affirm what it is we believe using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed.